Hello, my name is Bill Houlihan. I'm the uh, current secretary of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Irish Branch. I'm a, an ADR uh, lawyer. I'm a solicitor by original qualification. But having, as I described it, worshipped in the satanic church of litigation for 25 years, I converted to the one true faith of mediation about eight years ago. And I'm a very strong advocate of resolving disputes through alternative dispute resolution mechanisms and mediation in particular. Padraig Pearce said that uh, the education system in Ireland was the murder machine. I would say that in fact it is the litigation system in Ireland which is the murder machine. It's designed in such a way to accentuate the differences between parties, force them into taking very hostile positions towards each other and trying to accentuate their own case and deprecate the case of the other side. And that divides them. In contrast, uh, whereas in litigation you focus on matters historical, and as I say, sometimes to the point where they become matters hysterical, in mediation you focus not necessarily on the past, but on the future, and something that can work as an agreed solution for the parties in the future. There's a phrase that those who in quarrels interpose must often wipe a bloody nose, John Gay, 1685. So the idea of dispute resolution is not a new one, but mediation in Ireland has become much more of uh, a current issue in the past decade or so, when people are recognising the value of having a third party involved who allows the parties to come to a mutually agreed resolution of their issues as between themselves. It's not that they can't negotiate their way out of it, but sometimes there are difficulties about doing that. The great advantage of a mediator is that they, in the middle, can see both sides of the equation and they may see where common ground lies between them and where there's a potential for a future resolution. And the mediator, being able to see over both sides of the fence, so to speak, can guide parties to that common ground. The question often arises, when's the right time to mediate? There's no right time. There's no wrong time. The thing is that you should take the opportunity to mediate. The important thing is that a decision will be taken before attitudes harden or before perhaps costs of legal proceedings become an issue. I often explain to people that if you're talking about a high court case, the costs of getting to the point where a barrister stands up on the first day of the case to explain to a judge what the case is all about could be in the order of 50,000 euros of costs. Now, at that stage, the costs alone might become the issue which divides the parties. They might be able to agree on other things. They might be able to resolve other issues but costs could become the stumbling block. If before you get that far, you enter into discussions through the process of mediation, for a fraction of that cost, you could be looking at a solution. Equally, in order to get to the point where the barrister is standing up to explain to the judge what the case is all about, it could have taken two years or more, sometimes longer, depending on the complexities of the case. You could be into a mediation and have the whole thing resolved and the solution implemented in under two months. It's that quick and it's that effective. But you'll very rarely find that you're going to have a win-win for both sides in litigation. It doesn't happen. One side will win, the other side will lose. And sometimes both sides perceive themselves as losing. In contrast, in mediation, there's an opportunity for both sides to get something out of it, for both sides to win. And again, you can have a possible compromise. And it does take compromise. Very often going into mediation, you have to explain to a client that it's a question of what they need to come out with not what they want. The example that I use is you say, you might want a bucket of Italian ice cream coming out. That's a want, it's not a need. You have to identify with the client what is it that you actually need to make a future work. And that is your baseline. Anything above that, you could contemplate giving up. Equally, it could be a question of adverse publicity. People don't like washing their linen in public, so to speak. They don't want to have to get up in court and explain themselves. They don't want people to know that they've had a difficulty of some kind. It could be a reputational damage issue. And again, mediation is completely confidential. Nothing that happens within the mediation process is revealed. And as part of an agreed outcome for a mediation, confidentiality can be preserved. That the world at large doesn't get to know about the problems. Most people are prepared to be reasonable. They don't want to have to demand that they get their way in everything. And again, with the wish to compromise, people can achieve a result. First question is what a mediator should be able to do. 
A mediator should be able to get people to commit to the process. Even though you have a situation where the parties are very much at odds, a mediator should be able to get them to focus on the future. Again, remember, in court proceedings, people are focusing on the past and they're analysing to the nth degree what has happened and what has divided the parties. And they're trying to accentuate the positive of their own side and depreciate the negative. They're trying to point out all the infirmities of the case on the other side. A mediator will get people to stop that kind of behaviour and focus on the future, what they need to try and get a, an agreed outcome for both parties, and sometimes for more than both parties. So a mediator will get them to commit to that process. Equally, a good mediator will do a reality check with people and very subtly burst the bubbles of expectation, get them to question whether their expectations of potential outcome or what they might even have been told by their lawyers is a guaranteed outcome, whether that's realistic. And because it's coming from a, a disinterested, neutral party, and it's reflecting back uh, what is being said to them, they begin to wonder about that, and they get to think about it and look at it from an objective point of view, not just a subjective point of view. Equally, a mediator, uh, while bursting the bubbles, doesn't get into evaluating the, the case, doesn't tell them that they're wrong, but gets them to question and to think about what they've actually been told. And there can be no guarantees in litigation. And that's a matter that people need to understand. Again, the, what's called in the mediation world the batna and the watna. Now, that very simply means the best alternative to a negotiated outcome. And the watna is the worst alternative to a negotiated outcome. And you get them to think about what's the best that could happen if they don't agree a, so a solution to the problems of mediation and they go off elsewhere, perhaps to court. That's the high point. But equally, you get them to think about the watna, the worst case scenario. And in circumstances where there's no guarantee, if they were to lose, how much it would cost them, what the implications would be, the actual economic cost, the reputational cost, the delay, the effect it would have on them, their mental health and well-being. And when people begin to factor that into the equation, they're more amenable to trying to resolve matters in the short term. Again, a good mediator knows how to be a good listener. It's said that uh, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. And again, if you listen carefully to people, let them know that you've heard what they're saying, reflect back to them what they have said, so that they understand that you understand what they're saying. You don't approbate what they're saying, you don't validate what they're saying, you don't say you're right, but you show that you understand where they're coming from. That allows you then to take that to the other side, and part of the object of the mediation process is that you get the other side to understand one side's view. They don't have to accept the validity of it, but they get to understand it. And they get to understand why is somebody taking the approach that they are doing. It's not that they're just being unreasonable. They have a view. And from their perspective, it's a valid point of view. And once you have that recognition and understanding on both sides, you have the building blocks for moving forward. Equally, uh, the mediator will take what people have to say and work with it. And even after the mediation process is over, a mediator should remain committed to it. Sometimes things don't resolve on the day. The vast majority of mediations do, and are very successful within one day. Compare that to, say, five days, or even uh, 145 days of court proceedings. And that, I think, is the record in Ireland. But even for the cases that don't successfully mediate within a day, some of those come back on stream afterwards. People think about what they've heard. They reflect. They take it on board and they then come back through the mediator and they continue a process of dialogue. It may not be another mediation meeting, but there's a process of engagement, and that can work as well in terms of resolving the issues. Equally a question of credibility when it comes to accepting nominations. Sometimes there's a horse trading goes on beforehand, particularly when people are new to mediation. They feel that they have to come up with a list. Now, provided they've identified accredited mediators who are competent and capable, there's no reason not to accept one of their choice. And again, this shows a good faith on the, the party that you're acting for if you accept the other side's nominee. Particularly if that mediator is doing a good reality check with them, as they ought to do in the course of the process. And the fact that it's th their mediator, so to speak, or their nominee, adds to the process. Equally, when it comes to the process of, of mediation, if you say that you're committed to the process of mediation and you make the offer in the beginning, it shows that you were reasonable at the outset. You wanted to try and avoid all the expense and delay in relation to litigation. Now, that may be a partisan motive, but you're showing that you're willing to compromise, you're willing to be reasonable, and that can influence a court when it comes to the outcome. 
In Ireland, we haven't as yet had a great number of cases decided in relation to mediation. But in the UK, there are a lot of cases which are of very persuasive authority here, where parties who insisted on going to court were actually refused their court costs. Normally, if you win in court, you get your costs. But in England, there's a body of case law which held that parties, even though they won the case, were not entitled to get their legal costs because they were unreasonable in not going to mediation beforehand. And that is going to happen here at some point in the near future. It's something that people need to be conscious of. One of the great skills uh, to be learned by people in mediation is mediation advocacy. If you go to court, you're trying to persuade a judge sitting in judgment or an arbitrator in an arbitration that your side is correct. And Brian McMahon, a retired High Court judge, gave a very interesting talk to a chartered Institute of Arbitrators lunch a number of years ago. And he said, you listen to the advocate for the plaintiff and you say, my God, he's right. And you listen to the advocate for the defendant and you say, my God, she's right. And hopefully you listen to the little voice in the back of your head saying, they can't both be right. But in mediation, advocacy is a different thing. You now get to speak directly to the client on the other side in the opening session. And you get to put to them why you think that your client has a good case. Or the client themselves can do it. And again, in mediation, because everything is confidential, if somebody's in the wrong, you can shift the paradigm, so to speak, and change the entire tone of the engagement by apologising if you're wrong. Consider that as an opening gambit. If you go to court and you apologise in the opening statements in court, immediately the other side go, aha, we have a victory. Whereas in a mediation, because it's confidential, that cannot be repeated afterwards if the mediation isn't successful. But it can dramatically alter the entire tone of the engagement. If you're clearly wrong and you say, look, I apologise, I had to go down this way, I was advised legally I couldn't apologise, if we did, it would compromise the case, but man to man, woman to woman, I'm prepared to acknowledge today that you were right. And that can lead to a process of engagement. It's a sign of good faith. And that can change the outcome. Equally, lawyers need to understand their role in the process. It's not a question of going into the process and simply uh, acting in the way you would in court. They're there to advise. Parties also need to understand that it's not a question of proving that they're right. They're trying to work out something that can work for the future. I often say uh, there's no point in being proved right if the process will actually kill you. Think of it as a scenario of somebody driving towards a green light. They can see the runaway truck coming down the steep hill to their left hand side, which is obviously out of control. And it's been of no comfort to their family that the tombstone will read, he was right dead right as he drove along, and the fellow who killed him was dead dead wrong. People don't need to be proved right. They need to achieve a result. Again, preparing the client. Lawyers need to understand this, and they need to engage with the client beforehand to prepare them, explain it's not like a court. They need to understand who's going to be involved, where it's going to happen, the importance of getting out everything that they want to say, listening and evaluating what the other side are saying and what's happening throughout the process of the mediation. Anyone who's unfamiliar with the process may simply default to saying, oh, I'll do whatever my lawyer tells me. They need to understand that they are the decision makers. They're the people who call the shots at the end of the day and they need to know that they're in control. The lawyers are there to advise them not to control the process.